Okay, we're now being recorded. Thanks, everybody. Um, this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning call on Wednesday, December 4th, 2019. And we've got um, a good group with us today. I uh, just wanted to begin by inviting announcements. My Wi-Fi is a little wobbly, so my audio may not be great, but I just wanted to say a quick reminder about Sakai Camp. Um, registration is open, and I will paste the uh, registration link in the chat. It's free to register, but we do need you to register if you plan to attend on site because we are catering lunch, so we need a head count for that. Um, we will have some virtual attendee options similar to what we've done in the past. And, um, and I encourage you guys to think about attending. It's always a lot of fun and we get a lot of really great um, work done. So it's definitely a, a great event to attend if you can make it. It really is. Uh, and I see Josh has joined us. Excellent. Thanks for that link, Wilma. And... Um, Anybody else have any announcements before we dive in with, um, oh, no worries, Josh. Glad you could join us. Uh, any, any other announcements before we move into our main topics? Sean is typing, Sean Platt. Oh, okay. Good morning. All right, then, Josh, if you are ready, um, do I need to turn, give you some presenter privileges? No, I don't think so. We're just going to talk. So I'm, okay. um, I'm putting two uh, Google Doc links in the Etherpad. One All is right. to a draft of the roadmap document, and the other is to the feedback document where I'm going to be collecting your your thoughts. So. So definitely feel free to, um, you know, feel free to jump in this document and add your comments, you know, as you as you would in chat. I'll try and capture stuff, but you can feel free to jump in as well. So the way this is going to work is, um, uh, let me give you a little bit of background about the roadmap. Um, let me talk you through the uh, the roadmap document at a high level, and then let me ask you for your feedback. And I know that some of you have seen this multiple times, and so I, I appreciate your willingness to look at this again. I'm trying my best to consult with the major Sakai working groups as part of this iterative phase of the process. So I'm consulting with QA and marketing and teaching and learning and UX and the core team just as part of the, the, the discipline of the process. So, uh, so last year about this time, we were doing the same kind of a process. We were trying to establish a roadmap for 2020 through 2022. And so we talked about it in the fall. We brought it to Sakai Camp. We adopted it at Sakai Camp. So the process this year is a slightly more formal, although only a little. Um, I spent some time with a roadmap steering team in uh, September and October uh, to get a sense of what ought to go on the roadmap, trying to take last year's roadmap and move it forward a year, move it forward to 2021 to 2023. Then I presented a version of the roadmap at the Sakai Virtual Conference, and now I'm collecting feedback from working groups. So the plan is to revise it some more and bring it to Sakai Camp for discussion and adoption. So that's the process we're working through. We are smack in the middle of the iterative process of getting feedback. So this is the second version of the roadmap that I'm going to show you right now. A lot of, a lot of comments have been made. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, but I haven't changed this document. I'm waiting to capture all of the comments in this phase before doing another iteration. So if you look at it and you don't see stuff that you may have already said, that's the reason why. So pausing there for a second, are there are there questions about process that I can answer before we dive into content? Okay. Let's, let's, let's get to it then. So let me talk about the, the roadmap at a high level. So as, uh, as good academic technology plans do, it's more descriptive and more uh, proscriptive in the early year and less so as we get to the out years, just because needs change, technologies change, and we can't always, uh, we can't always predict those kinds of changes. So uh, the plan gets much more toward uh, being opportunistic and less prescriptive in 2023, especially in 2022, to a certain extent. So uh, so in, in 2021, 
here's what we're thinking. And this, this comes in four groupings. So I'm thinking about new features, improvements to existing features, technical improvements. I'm thinking about uh, there, I'm thinking about uh, services and, uh, and QA consistency, uh, QA testing rather, and, uh, and UI consistency. And then there are infrastructure upgrades, changes to the, the major underlying technologies that make Sakai go. So let's let's work our way from left to right. <clears throat> so in 2021, here are the new features that are being proposed in this version of the roadmap. Lessons 2.0. There's been a lot of conversation about this. Uh, we've brought it to this group before. The launch site would consider this to be our major contribution in uh, in in 2021. We'd propose cloud storage improvements. So that that's both Box and Dropbox support and some of the next gen integration ideas that we talked about at the last meeting. Uh, the date wizard. We currently, have, in 20, we'll have a date manager that shows all the dates in a course. The idea of a date wizard will be to automatically uh, change those dates via, you know, some sort of number of offset days or with some kind of calendar logic. So that's something that's that's uh, proposed in 2021. Uh, my hope is that UVA Site Builder will be contributed for 2021. Uh, that there may be an evaluations replacement. There's a, there's a lot of comment about that in the marketing team the other day. I know some argue for, some argue against. I know it's a contrib tool, but it's also one that uh, you know a fair number of schools rely on, and so I find myself worrying about presenting them with needless friction. Um, and also document annotation. So those are the new features for 2021. For improvements, uh, this version of the roadmap proposes a focus on faculty-facing in-course analytics. So I'm thinking about uh, you know a a thoughtful revision to the statistics tool. Westerns. Uh, contribution in 20 takes us down this road and the question is uh, can we go further so then we also think about improvements to site publishing to samago rubrics greater and some of these others uh, here i'm i'm envisioning addressing uh, batches of well thought through jiras uh, for these tools so for example i know forums has a bunch of jiras that have been written and thought through by a by the forums modernization team so those are the kinds of improvements that i would consider to be part of this proposal in 2021. For technical improvements, there's the grading service, which is already two thirds done. Uh, the notification service, which is meant to both pull together notifications into one place and to handle consistently notifications from the various tools. UI consistency, automated UA testing, uh, beginning the process of replacing reusable components like the calendar or the file picker. And then an infrastructure upgrades, uh, finish the upgrade to JSF2, and upgrade some of our core libraries. So as you can see, some of those libraries get updated every year under infrastructure upgrades. So that's 2021. 2022, again, a little bit less specific, but here I'm thinking uh, a new notifications hub, um, forums 2.0, a new mobile first UI. Um, I know there's, there's been a lot of comment about uh, pushing the new mobile first UI to 2021, and I actually agree, um, although I haven't changed this document to reflect those comments yet. Uh, for process reasons. Uh, what else into, in 2022? Improvements to assignments, to site info, more on, on the order of in-course analytics, resources, which is long overdue, search and other opportunistic improvements. And then you, we can sort of, you guys can look off to the right and take a look at the, uh, the improvements proposed for in the technical lane and in the infrastructure lane. And then in 2023, uh, this version of the roadmap proposes a, an achievement service, which would be a thoughtful integration with badging providers that would uh, provide some gamification of Sakai. So think about, uh, you know, getting a badge if you're the first to 10 posts in the forum in your course. There are all sorts of other ways to think about this, but that's the kind of use that we're envisioning. Uh, and also some, some deeper revisions to Samago in 2023. Opportunistic feature improvements in 2023 and uh, potentially a, a, a change on the technical side that separates out a new JavaScript front end. Earl has talked about this some um, uh, in conversations with, with people along the way. And the idea is to uh, take the, the front end of Sakai that people see and move it into its own GitHub repository and make it so that it can iterate from a feature perspective more quickly than it does today. And we'll talk to a back end that will supply data and we'll change much more slowly. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that might happen in three years. It might take four, you know, but I put it on the roadmap so that we're beginning to think about it. So uh, that is uh, the mad dash through the roadmap. 
So what I would love to do is ask you guys three questions. So question number one is what aspect, what aspects of this roadmap are on target? Um, whether because whether in their sequencing or in their content, you know, is this the right stuff? Is this the right timing? Uh, then what aspects should be improved and what if anything is missing? So let's start with uh, aspects of this roadmap that are on target. So feel free to put your comments in the chat to add your comments directly to this feedback document or to, you know, to, to speak up. Um, I was wondering, is a project like standardizing um, interactions in Sakai something that would show up on the roadmap? Because I noticed that if you want to, for example, set a release date, it's a totally different way to do it on a lessons page versus a test and quiz um, versus a resource. And that's very confusing when I try to explain to my faculty what, how when they're trying to put together a course, um, they have to approach this, what's essentially the same task in three different ways. And I think that's due to the fact that we approach Sakai from such a tool-centric manner. So is some sort of standardization effort something that we're going to be considering? And if so, is it something that could show on the roadmap? Good, good point. So yeah, I definitely captured that. Um, what, do, what do others think? Well, I think that's partly the UI consistency, um, you know, using consistent terminology throughout. Um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, assignments and tests and quizzes are basically the same process, but different wording. So, you know, an open date in assignments versus an available date in tests and quizzes. Um, you know, I think just changing that language to make them essentially the same language um, would be helpful. About resources, a different approach and lesson pages, you go up to the little gear thing, which doesn't even have a word to it. So um, I agree that UI consistency is part of this. I just would like to see if there's a way to ensure that the larger issue is rolled into some sort of technical improvement aspect. Or maybe it's not something we're ready to address in the next three years, in which case, maybe you put it on the roadmap for 2025. Okay, so I've, I've definitely captured that comment, uh, so, so thanks. What other comments do you have? What's on target and what can be improved? Well, I don't see accessibility improvements or fixes listed anywhere here. Um, I know that some of these uh, tools that have been mentioned need them, grade book, tests and quizzes. We um, just got back on the accessibility uh, review for 19 as being major issues, uh, major areas that have significant issues with uh, keyboard accessibility especially. Um, and also the uh, analytics, I know that uh, the statistics tool is totally uh, inaccessible right now. Uh, for um, users with assistive technology, um, that kind of thing. I don't know if that needs to be reflected here uh, more prominently, but um, yeah, it, it, it probably ought to be. That's a that's a good point. I've captured that. I mean, there's always a challenge with documents like this. Um, if it's too granular, people will look at it and throw up their hands and say they can't parse it. And if it's not granular enough, then people will say stuff isn't in there. So trying to trying to find that balance is important. But I think I think accessibility is not sufficiently represented here. What else? This is good stuff so far. And just to tag on to that, it might be nice to bring this to the accessibility working group. It doesn't look like they've been included. Um, my plan was to put that on the agenda for um the 13th of december but i haven't uh, but i haven't actually edited the uh, the doc yet so that's oh, great same on me 
Josh, this is Adam at PC. I'm a little curious regarding um, the prioritization of front-loading of evaluations replacement versus the mobile-first UI, um, because I, uh, you did speak to the fact that many institutions do use evaluations. We are one of them, but it seems like mobile is also a pain point, so I'm wondering why evaluations has been front-loaded in the year prior. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the truth is that, uh, you know, behind the scenes, I've already started to agitate for a new mobile first UI in 2021, but I haven't changed this document just because I had told myself that I was going to get all the feedback and then, you know, do a new version of the document so the versioning didn't get confusing. But yeah, a, a lot of people have said that 2022 is too late for a new mobile first UI and it really needs to be sooner. And lots of people have said, well, there aren't all that many schools using, you know, using evaluations. And those are those, those are both really good comments. I mean, I I worry about the schools that do, but but I think you're right that a new mobile first UI has got to be one of our top priorities. I mean, it's it's a good question though, right? I mean, so what should be as we think about the things that ought to be foregrounded and front loaded? What are the most important things to address in 2021? I have to agree that uh, mobile um, improvements are um, are significantly important. It's also important for um, WCAG 2.1 for accessibility. Um, many of the changes in 2.1 are, um, you know, improving UI for mobile um, and mobile accessibility, and that's something I know that um, we've already heard uh, some comments uh, that folks would like us to do an accessibility review on 2.1 um, standards. So. All right, so I'm, I'm seeing a couple of comments in the chat. There's a question about a, a confluence page for the evaluations replacement work, and I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's being you know discussed among the schools that use it, but I don't think it's gone further than that. Um, Jennifer has uh, has given a plus one to mobile in 2021, so I'll I'll note that in the feedback document. Um, so Trisha, it's it's 10:20. Um, how much how much more time do we have for this? Um, I, want, I want to be respectful of the agenda. Since we we started this conversation at 10:05, um, we'll go to 10:25. So another five minutes. Okay. So we so we got five minutes. So let's hear the most top of mind things that you guys have to say. So. Uh, stuff that ought to be foregrounded in 2021, stuff that ought to be pushed back, uh, stuff that really isn't here. Um, I'm curious to hear from folks who haven't had a chance to speak up yet. Wow, silence. What does uh, so help me understand what what does silence mean in this context? Because it it generally means assent in uh, in Sakai context, but I'm not sure that the general assent is all that meaningful in this kind of a conversation. It's a little hard to tell since we can't see each other. Um, you know, it could mean people are doing other things and are not focused on this conversation, but it could also mean assent. So I don't know. Um, I, I would add that uh, some improvements to um, faculty facing analytics uh, line up fairly well with what's happening provincially in Ontario at the moment. Um, and you do have two major sky institutions up here. Um, and I know Western's done a lot of work with that. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that in 2021. Um, heck, I would have been happy to see it yesterday. So it, it's great to see it coming. <clears throat> I think definitely that work is going to rely on all of us, especially in this group, to you know do some work with with faculty on our campuses and figure out you know what's really needed and what to focus on. But yeah, yeah, we can definitely do more. So we, in our in our final three minutes. Um, what else is, is is burning up your minds in terms of uh, comments that you want to make and feedback that you want to provide? There are at least a couple of people typing in the chat at this moment.
Josh, were there any major items that came up in other reviews of the roadmap that might be worth noting that aren't reflected yet in the document? Um, yeah, there are. So let me um, <clears throat> let me just capture Jennifer's comment, which is uh, um, proctoring platform integration. Yeah, so if there are specific integrations that we want to foreground, this would be a good chance to to um, to put those forth. <clears throat> so Tricia, to your point, um, so I've uh, I've recently consulted with uh, the QA team and the marketing team. So those of you guys who are in this uh, feedback document, you can see it all. You can see all the feedback here, but I can summarize a bit as well. Um, marketing was really interested in foregrounding notifications. Uh, and UI um, and some some work on on both the assignment creation and the assignment uh, grading workflows as being really really central. So those are things that I think especially the the notion of of uh, pushing the UI sooner that's something that you don't see in this document, but a lot of people have said. Um, I think the notion of uh, of pushing assignments and notifications especially earlier in the list and maybe some pushing something else back a little bit might make sense i mean that that's that's what i seem to be hearing as well that uh, the notifications are a big deal um let's see what else um there was uh, we've had a lot of feedback about annotation uh and about um we've had some feedback about student facing analytics you know things like uh an overall progress bar for the course, you know, answering the question, how on track am I? Um, you know, we've met with measures like number of posts, number of responses, percent of assignments completed before deadlines versus after deadlines. So those are some of the, the other suggestions that have come up recently. So let's see, in, in the chat, um, we've got a plus one for Proctor. Oh, sorry, yeah, yep. we're at time. We're at time, okay. Yeah. And so thank you very much, Josh, that, that's helpful. And yeah, there's there's some assent about proctoring, some agreement in the, in the community for that. So, um, and I've switched over to Etherpad. Let me bump up so we can see what the JIRAs are there. Just wanna say uh, thank you guys for the time and thank you for the feedback. Thank you, Josh. So it's time for JIRA Palooza. And the first JIRA up is SAC 42759, which is one that Sean sent our way to discuss. Um, I pasted the link in the chat for you. And uh, let's see, this is an option to share answers and feedback with students who did not submit. So I'm gonna jump into that. Jira and I know Sean is on the call so he can get some feedback. Sean, do you want to walk us through this a little bit? Uh, this just came up at one of the triage calls or somewhere along the line. I, I looked at it and saw that there was opposing uh, views. So I just wanted to get a feedback from the uh, different groups to see what their thoughts on it was as far as um, adding this feature or using the workaround. So there's some pros and cons about it or just how it should be implemented. I haven't, I haven't read it carefully. So the use case is an instructor has weekly quizzes and decides to drop some number of the lowest scores. Students may opt to skip those assessments. So this is Tiffany. I, I was involved in some of this discussion. Um, if it helps to summarize. Yeah, um, so um, the proposal here is that in some cases we do have instructors who want to release feedback answer keys um, for a quiz to students who didn't submit and there's currently no mechanism to do that uh, because you can only release feedback for existing submissions. Um, and while this would be useful, I think there, it would require some significant development, possibly, um, because it would require some sort of empty creation of a submission um, 
for these students. Uh, but I guess there is a mechanism for doing that uh, right now in the database. Uh, I was not aware of that. Um, and I asked my colleague, David, who's on the call right now, um, as far as uh, you know, how, how instructors might obtain an empty submission, um, they could give a zero uh, to the students who don't submit. Um, so that, that might be some structure that would allow creating such an empty submission. Um, but I think there are some very um, complicated considerations for you know, how we want this feedback to be uh, possible to display, what types of feedback we want to make possible to display. So certain uh, feedback dependencies um, exist, like in order to uh, have selection level feedback or question level feedback, you actually have to answer the question. Um, and I think that you wouldn't want to display uh, by default all the incorrect answer feedback. Well, maybe you would. I mean, see, that's the, the question is what type of feedback should be displayed to the students who did not submit if this is developed? Um, and uh, and how would that be displayed and when would that be displayed? Um, because they might want to release the feedback to non-submitters at a later date than they release the feedback to everyone who did submit, for example. I'm just gonna chime in a little bit uh, for the technical aspect of it. And this is to me clearly one that would not be you know a simple change or anything it would be a pretty complex change to samago um i, I think when i was talking to you before I, I might have been confusing samago a little bit with um with assignments uh, as far as like the blank submissions go so i'd have to poke around in the database a little bit and see what could be done as far as creating a like a dummy submission maybe with the four grade flag not set to see if that would allow for feedback gotcha thanks for that clarification mm -hmm. yeah so do folks on the call have any um input or feedback about this issue or are you seeing this come up at your own institutions and um it has come up for us a couple times here at isu um i think some way of of providing that feedback would be useful um but yeah you'd have to really kind of think through the how things display if somebody hasn't actually submitted. So right now, the way that feedback is displayed is if it's enabled uh, and a student has a submission, a feedback link is presented to them uh, under the section of assessments they've taken um, with that uh, assessment submission. Um, <clears throat> so usually these are you know unique to the assessment and they can have different settings uh, for the feedback per assessment um, so you know you might want to release an answer key for some tests but not for others if they're homework tests and some of them are you know um, exams you might not want to release as much information for the exams um, so I think there would need to be uh, a place to display this in the UI to students that separated it out from the actual submissions as well. Um, possibly a third category on the assessments page, like you know, feedback for <laughs> things you did not submit or something like that. Does this issue come up often enough that just printing out the feedback and sharing it with students who haven't submitted isn't a good enough solution? As far as I'm aware, the instructors I've spoken to have been sufficiently satisfied with that for the most part. Um, and that's what I recommended um, in this case as well, was to print off the feedback, um, you know, the answer key. Now, there are certain question types that printing off the answer key isn't very helpful for. So for example, the calculated question, which automatically generates 
um, an individual question on a per student basis uh, does not present correctly in a printout uh, because it, it has nothing to generate in that um, export screen. Okay. So in that case, but it might be one, helpful. One small case, I, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, these are all kind of um, small yeah. cases yeah. that, yeah. Um, but I don't know, it may be more prominent at other institutions. I just haven't heard a lot of complaint about it personally. Right. It's It's just, to me, not, it doesn't sound like there's a really strong case to devote developer time for this kind of work, which um, will be very complicated, it sounds like. And aside from just the complexity of the change itself, it's Samago. So anytime you touch anything, <laughs> it turns into a nightmare avalanche of yeah of, <laughs> of goodness in yep. general very painful okay so i you know is there a consensus among those on the call to um just resolve this as won't fix maybe some plus ones to not fix it and minus ones if you believe this needs attention. Okay, so the consensus I'm seeing of those who have responded is that we are going to resolve this, this won't fix. So that's great. And I I appreciate the time that Tiffany and John and Charles and everybody who commented in this JIRA took to explain the issues and the pros and cons of, of dealing with it. And David, for your um, time to look into it a little bit. So I'm gonna mark this, actually I'm not logged in, so I can't mark it yet. Let me log in so I can mark it as reviewed and um, Sean, do you want to update it or move it into a, um, a won't fix status? Sure. So are you, are you planning on leaving a comment? Is that what you're thinking? Yes, I can leave a comment. And I also want to mark the label that it's been um, TL reviewed. Oh. Okay, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, sorry about that. Taking so much time. Um, and let me just comment. Yeah, and I don't mind closing it afterwards. All right, thanks. Thanks everybody for your feedback on this. Okay, hopefully that's enough of a summary there. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, so the next JIRA, Tiffany, thanks for taking the time to put some more JIRAs in here for us, um, is SAC 4227, no, 42772. Let me copy and paste that link into the chat for everyone and then I'll jump over there and share that as well. And so Tiffany, would you mind leading us through this one? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you remember, but a while back uh, we discussed the option in tests and quizzes to set a background color um, as being potentially an accessibility issue. It was actually something that was brought up to me um, by our um, student uh, access uh, folks at UVA. 
Um, and, uh, and we decided to just disable the background color option um, because it would be complicated to change it. Um, and uh, we didn't see the, the pedagogical usefulness of it. So at UVA, we turned it off temporarily and a number of instructors apparently use it as a proctoring aid, which we didn't realize, um, so that they can see uh, at a glance if they're in a large lecture hall that students uh, are on the test or not by um, noticing a different color on the screen. Um, so we re-enabled it at UVA. Um, and there was some discussion on uh, the accessibility mailing list um, about you know, potentially um, improving the workflow for setting a background color to limit the palette of colors um, so that they would necessarily be compliant with the black text. Um, the issue is that although instructors can set colors on their own for um, specific question types, some question types, true, false, survey, all the letters and numbers in the test uh, are governed uh, by the Sakai um, you know, uh, skin, and they're always black. Uh, so if you set a dark uh, background color that is not a good contrast with black, it can be a problem. Um, but the issue, there are several issues with uh, being able to limit the color palette. We would need first to have a color picker that is keyboard accessible. The current one is not. Um, we would need to take away the text box that is accessible uh, where you can type in a hex value to set the color. Um, and we would need some way to go back through and fix any existing assessments that might be non-compliant uh, with the new colors so that they still have colors uh, if we were to limit the color palette. Um, from my perspective, this is a very limited use case uh, for proctoring. And it would be very complicated to change, uh, very complicated to develop this um, option to set only accessible background colors. Uh, so my vote for this is won't fix and um, just you know, point users who um, add background colors to our help documentation uh, that indicates that you need to check your color is good with black. Uh, and if a student, um, does have an accessibility need for a different background color, address it by creating a second copy of the exam uh, released to just that student so that they can um, take it you know, with, the, um, with the need um, taken care of. So um, let's invite some feedback from the group so Tiffany is proposing that we resolve this issue as won't fix. Um, and so if you have questions or concerns about that, please raise them or just do a plus one if you're in agreement with that assessment. What about putting some sort of contrast checker right with any uh, type of color picker in Sakai? So there's a few spots that I can think of that have color selection areas. And yes, improving that would help uh, from an accessibility perspective, but just adding a contrast checker to that. That would be cool. Um, like I don't know how, <laughs> how possible that would be. Um, the other thing is that um, CK Editor is the most prominent um, thing that has color picking. Um, so I don't know how it would work for like a lesson page where your CK editor instances are individual and apart from the lesson page style sheet. Um, you know, potentially uh, different from the lesson page style sheet. So I'm not sure how how well that would work or how possible that would be, um, but it's definitely, I, I think that's a cool idea. So is that a different JIRA if, if, some, if we want to add that feature or do we want to put a comment in this JIRA to add an accessibility, I mean, a um, web contrast checker somehow? I think that would Although be a different JIRA. Okay. Yeah, 
then Tiffany, I'm going to invite you to update this Jira with our comments. And I'm not sure if it's appropriate for us to change the status and the resolution on this, or, or if that needs to go to the core team. Uh, Sean, you're on the core team. What are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I would probably just give Alan, and the same with the previous one, we can give the original reporter the um, an update and probably an option to uh, respond, but um, just say that a recommendation is to close this as won't fix, or we can okay. go ahead and close it as won't fix as well. Um, Cortine is just a, a placeholder assigning you at the moment. Um, really, we can always reopen any any ticket and, and change the status later. So it's not okay. So uh, Tiffany, I'll invite you to to do that if you don't mind, since um, that's, so that we can move on. Yep, I am commenting right now. Awesome. Thank you very much, and thanks everybody for your feedback. All right, let we have yeah we, we have. Good time. So um, we're moving on to SAC 42840. I'll paste that link into the chat for everyone. And then I'll jump over into that JIRA. And this is about recovering deleted assessments, attachments, and rubrics. Oh, when recovering attachments and rubrics are not recovered. And it looks like Matt Jones created this and Tiffany you're bringing it to our attention so again would you mind leading us through it yeah sure um so there's a new feature uh in 19 or 20 I guess to allow instructors to recover a deleted uh, draft assessment um apparently when you do that the attach any attachments to question text um, and rubrics are permanently deleted on deleting the assessment. Uh, and I think this is a, a fairly big problem because a lot of instructors do create questions, especially a file upload question, where the entire question text is download the attached Word document, open it in Word, answer the questions there, you know, save it, and upload back your response. Um, and so you could essentially lose an entire question um, by losing the attachments. Um, now, uh, rubrics, I, I'm not as concerned about uh, because I feel like you could, you know, have some kind of warning that says uh, your rubrics will be lost if you delete this assessment just on that delete assessment screen, um, especially since that is a separate service. Uh, but I feel that the attachments are uh, very important. Uh, to include in the recovery process to not delete them on deleting the assessment. And one of the issues uh, that's been brought up in all of these discussions about deleted assessments is having an option to hard delete after soft deleting. Now, um, in uh, the past, uh, assessment deletion was always a soft delete. So I personally don't feel that it's that critical to enforce a need to hard delete uh, things uh, that have never previously been hard deleted, but it does sound like the attachments um, have been hard deleted. Uh, I spoke with David about this um, briefly last week as well. Um, and, uh, and so those would need, I guess, um, a new way to hard delete them if they are uh, now given a way to be soft deleted, if that makes sense. So we're getting some comments in the chat. Um, Sean has mentioned that an assessment trash was added to Sakai 20 in 194 and references that JIRA, which is also linked um, in the description here of this JIRA. Um, and Wilma and Sean are both agreeing that data loss um, could be considered a blocker. So this is currently listed as major. Um, and I am not sure what, let's scroll on down and see what the, um, Blocker, Laura Geckler, thanks for joining and your comments. So definitely make it a blocker. And I'm going to go ahead and do that.
And so what we're proposing is a soft deletion so that it can be recovered. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that, that's the my recommendation. Okay. Um, the other suggestion in the JIRA was to just put a message to instructors on deleting that they'll lose all their attachments. But I personally don't think that's very acceptable because the question, the, the attachments can be very essential to the question. So if an assessment is deleted and it has an attachment, how did they get to that attachment if the assessment is gone? Well, they didn't. I mean, previously you couldn't, users couldn't recover assessments. Uh, they were fairly easy to recover for a developer in the database because it's a single number value in the database that determines whether an assessment is, is existing or deleted. Um, but users only now can recover assessments with this new trash tab. Uh, okay. so, so the problem is that the attachments go away on deleting the assessment um, gotcha. and can't, can't yet be recovered. So we're, what we want to do is not hard delete the attachments or the rubrics, but retain that relationship in the soft deletion of the assessment so that it can be recovered when the if the when and if the assessment is recovered. Yes. Okay. I do not know what that entails on the back end, um, but that sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, I don't know how tests and quizzes stores its attachments. I know it's in a separate sort of invisible place um, than, you know, like resources, for example. Um, but it's definitely in content somewhere. It's actually stored in the same place that resources are stored. It's just, I guess, referenced different in the database. So it really is still there, right? Um, no, when you delete the the assessment, it deletes, it physically deletes it from the from the disk. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. I confirmed that in Vagrant. Okay. Monday. So I wonder if there would be any way to essentially make the deleted attachments go into a trash area, kind of like resources have a trash area, so that they could be recovered along with the assessment. I'd have to look look through the code a little more to to answer to that. I know that on, on disk, it doesn't store it by like the original file name. It uses a UUID, so that's referenced in the database somewhere. So there'd have to be a change somewhere to keep that metadata along with the file because both of them are removed currently. Well, and we should be looking at Sakai 20 mm -hmm. to be certain of, of what happens. And so I, I'm hearing that, that we would like to add this feature. So Tiffany, can you summarize that, that the teaching and learning group I, and I assume folks are in agreement with that. We only heard from Tiffany and Laura, I'm not going to reference your related thing because we're just going to focus on these JIRAs and um, <laughs> thanks. Okay, because we have limited time. Um, so we do have some agreement that that yes, we should we should make this um recoverable the assess the uh, attachments and the rubrics however that can be done okay getting some confirmations from folks great tiffany do you mind updating the jira to that effect yep. i will update the jira to indicate that teaching and learning um, finds it important to make those okay. items recoverable okay great thank you very much all right, we do have a few more minutes and we have one more. I'm not sure we'll be able to get through it, but um, it is SAC 42493. I'll paste that in over here in the chat. And then uh, let's go take a look at that one. Uh, this is a feature request to 
give options for additional TA permissions. And Tiffany, you um, created this JIRA. So yeah. want to talk us through it? Yeah, sure. This is something I created a while ago, but it came up in some conversations um, with a TA again this week um, where uh, instructors may want TAs to essentially have full permissions in the gradebook. And there are two permissions in particular that can't be enabled for TAs right now that are of interest. Um, one is uh, allowing TAs to use the show scores option in the course grade column so that the TA can see those uh, total points or percentages resulting in the letter grade. You know, this is if the, the TA has permission to view the course mm -hmm. grades. Um, and then the other thing uh, is, oh, and to be able to, to grade override in that course grade column, uh, that's you know another component of that. Currently, the TA can't access that menu that would let them uh, view the scores and override grades. Uh, and then the other important um, piece uh, for these instructors is allowing TAs to import, export and import grades. So I was working with um, a large class where the instructor has several TAs. The TAs are entering grades in their individual section sites for their discussion sections, but the instructor wants them to be able to upload, you know, download those grades from their discussion section and then upload it back to the instructor's site uh, for the final grading, but the TAs can't do that. The instructor has to be able to do, or the instructor has to do the uploading back into their site uh, to import, and the instructor might not want to do that if they have 20 TAs, <laughs> and, and each TA has several sections. So, um, you know, this, this is a request essentially to allow TAs to be capable of doing that, to allow the instructor to enable that um, that access to the TAs. Okay. So in other words, um, without making them full instructors mm -hmm. in the site. Mm -hmm. uh, folks on the call, are you guys encountering issues like this at your institutions? Do you feel like this is um, something that needs to be addressed. See Josh is typing. Josh wants to know if this is the column where the messaging options appear in Sakai 20. Um, I have no I'm idea. Not, I'm not aware of that. The um, course grade column is, um, is where the instructor can override course grades and um, just view the scores. Basically, it shows a percentage for um, for grade books that have weighting, or it shows both percentage and points for um, a grade book that has, you know, that's not weighted. So um, I'm not getting uh, much in the way of response to this particular issue, but I would invite folks to vote for it, log in to JIRA and vote for it if you believe it's important. Um, Tiffany, as a comment from the teaching and learning group, I think I would say we've reviewed it, but have no um, strong consensus one way or the other. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, thank well, you. Okay, okay. Here I come. Uh, there is no there is no test plan. Even features need test plans. In fact, think through your requirements and write the test plan so that every part that you believe should work and shouldn't work has a has a plan for testing that it does or doesn't work. Because you so can get I, you can get burned on features if you don't make sure that you have it well designed. I'm yeah. well aware of that. I believe I put in the comments some outlines for um, 
the issue being, oh, maybe I didn't put it in the comments. Yeah, the, the issue is that I don't know what people would want. And that's another reason why I brought this to this call. Mm -hmm. um, so I did put that in the description, um, you know, that I'm not sure what the ultimate desired uh, functionality would be. Um, well, so. so at Notre Dame, we have a we have a TA that does these things. And what we do is we create an instructor role and we label it TA. We have another TA role, and these are tricky having two TA roles, but we have another TA role that's an undergrad TA. And that is the one that has the section TA uh, permission. And so you have to go through and add that TA to the grade book and specify what they can and cannot do. It's not really thrilling to think about uh, having an undergraduate student function as a TA for a course, but it's ubiquitous across campus in that it's usually an undergrad student who took the course this semester or two before. So, um, so that's one way to get around this, but I think the granularity of control that you're talking about um, is really helpful for reducing the number of TA roles to just one. Yeah, well, so, I mean, we are Sorry. aware that you can change the role to Sorry, instructor. Tiffany, I, need, I need to interrupt because we're just about out of time. And I'm very sorry. Uh, the uh, And Sean Foster has posted a reminder about the UX call coming right up in room three after this meeting. So um, we're going to have to wrap up here. Uh, and I apologize. Our next meeting is on December 19th. Um, currently, we have no agenda, but um, it could be another Jira Palooza. Uh, or someone could, if someone has a um, topic that they would like to share, please let me know. Um, and then our then we're into the new year. January 15th will be our only meeting in January, and February 5th will be the next meeting after that. So reminder, register for Sakai Camp if you can come. And um, Tiffany, if we need to revisit this, Jira, we can do it next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha, for keeping us all on the straight and